I'm ready. Can you hear me? I was kind of wondering tonight if you were going to be able to hear me or not. Sound kind of congested. Can you hear that? If, you, if any of you have ever, ever heard me talk before, you're probably saying he doesn't sound like he normally does. I've been under attack for about the last week, so, uh, but I'm talking better now than I was last week, you know, come on me about Wednesday evening, and uh, by Thursday I was sicker than a dog, as they say, and by Valentine's Day, by Valentine's Day I was sounding like Barry White, <laughs> and that was about the only romantic thing about it. <laughs> Amy said, keep your romance to yourself. <laughs> but praise God, I'm here. Amen. Angel texted me yesterday. How are you doing? <laughs> Pastor called me last night. Son, how are you? Are you going to be able to make it? I should be able to. Well, if something occurs, let me know. Well, I don't think anything will occur, but I'll let you know. And he said, well, you just told me that you're getting better day by day. So you got 24 hours. He said, you'll, you'll be all right. <laughs> and they called and checked on me again this afternoon. Or I was getting, I was away from my phone and, and getting ready. And Amy answered the phone and talked to pastor. And I think she, she said, I think he said that he's in Seoul. <laughs> so maybe he's in Korea or he's passing through Korea. But I'm here. The enemy has attacked my body. He's caused me to be sick in my body for the last week. And uh, he's been attacking me up one side and down the other. But I am here. Amen. I'm here. I came in here tonight. I tried to study and prepare. And uh, trying to do that when you've got uh, your head feeling like you're in a fishbowl is, is difficult. But I got my outlines done. I got my notes and everything done. I tried to open them up, and it said that I couldn't open them up because I didn't have an internet connection. I'm just telling you what's happening to me tonight, okay? So Amy goes back. You probably see me. What's Don doing up here? You know, I'm just going crazy with my tablet. Amy takes it back there to Rob. He gets me signed in to the internet. And then I open up my file, and all my outlines, all the margins are messed up, so there's words everywhere. Amy's still trying to fix it. So she said, did you bring your notes? <laughs> Thank God for the anointing. Um, but as all this stuff was transpiring, as pastor likes to say, it kind of brought me, the Lord brought me to a passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 10. This has nothing to do with what I want to talk about tonight. But in Matthew 10, verse 18, Jesus, my Bible's in red letters, Jesus says, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And you know what he says in verse 19? But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. So I'm waiting, Lord. It's the seven o'clock hour. I'm waiting, Lord. He goes on to say in verse 20, For it is not ye that speaks, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. How befitting. How befitting. Because we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit tonight and His activity in our lives. Amen. So if you want to just, uh, did you fix it, dear? All the way. It's in a PDF, so I can't touch it and mess it up. All right, then I'll just set these over here. All right. So let's just get a scripture or vantage point and get started here. Uh, go with me to 1 John chapter 2. Yeah! Thank you. 1 John chapter 2. To set the stage, I just want to share a little story with you. Me and my family, we're always looking for God to be working in our lives. We're out and about. We're going out to dinner. We're shopping. Or if we're just at home or we're believing for something, no matter how small or minuscule it may seem to us or to others, those around us, we're looking to see God show up in our lives. 
And, uh, and sometimes it's just, you know, we're driving through a parking lot. Maybe it's raining outside, pouring rain, and all the parking spaces are filled. There's no place to be had. And then we just roll up to the front of the store there, and boom, there's somebody pulling out for us to pull in there. And I look to my wife, and I say three words. What do I say? She's conspiring against me. <laughs> I say it's the anointing. It's the anointing. <laughs> or when we go into a restaurant and there's, there's an hour and a half wait and she gives them our, our name and she says, oh, we got a table just for you. And I look at her and I say, there you go. There you go. Or when our son decides that he wants to play saxophone and how our music and nobody else has a saxophone left to rent, only trombones, and he doesn't want to play a trombone. And we sit in the car wash in Brookville, Ohio, and we pray, gathered hands and prayed for a saxophone. Two hours later, we go to our friend's wedding, to a friend's wedding, and the friends that we're sitting with, Amy shares how we need a saxophone. And our friend Charlene says, our daughter played saxophone. She's got a brand new one at home that's been in the closet for two years now. He can have it. He can have it. It's the anointing. Now you're catching on. Sometimes it's, it's even it's just for me. It's anointing just for me, you know. Like when, when I get something, I get blessed with something and I say, it's the, and I look at her and I said, you know what that is, don't you? And she's like, it's the anointing. <laughs> like you got blessed, but I didn't get anything. But it's just kind of become a common thing that I say, you know, just, just calling out God, recognizing God and his blessings and his favor working in our lives through the illuminating presence of his spirit. You know, I, I perceive us as being like Jesus. We're just walking around, you know, we're blessed and we're touching people just like Shannon touched me earlier, call me healed. You know, we're just walking around being blessed because the anointing of God is working. It's working in our lives. But you know, the last couple of months, our family has been under attack. You know, Amy was in the hospital twice in as many weeks, just about. Um, our finances have been under attack. You, you all know that I suffer from, I shouldn't say suffer, but I deal with headaches. And they've been really, you know, ramping up here lately. Just a lot of things, you know, that that uh, just kind of snowball, you know what I mean? And I'm praying to God and I'm just asking him, you know, I'm praying and confessing his word and, and just saying, God, what's going on? Why isn't anything happening? Why is all this stuff happening? You know, where are the answers? Why aren't they manifesting? And you know what he said to me? He said, son, what about the anointing? And I was like, what? <laughs> What about the anointing? And I said, well, what about the anointing? <laughs> you know, I'm looking for answers, God. What about the anointing? He says, well, you believe for the small things. And when, you, when they come to pass and you receive them, you say it's all about the anointing. What about the anointing working in the big things in your life, Shannon? What about the manifestation of my power and presence bringing things to pass in regards to the big things in your life? So now that question resonates in my mind and in my spirit. It's a question that I ask a lot now just to keep it, on, keep it fresh in my mind and on the tip of my tongue. What about the anointing? The anointing's there for all of us. Do you think that the anointing is available to you as modern day believers, as new covenant believers? Do you think the anointing is there for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. What's John say about it? Did you make it to 1 John? Yes. Chapter 2? All right, let me get there. I'm still in Matthew chapter 10. Let me tell you something. The enemy's trying to mess around tonight. 
The enemy's trying to mess around. He's trying to start fires. He's trying to build strongholds. And he's trying to stop whatever God wants to do tonight. All right? Well, I'm going to tell you one thing right now. Standing up here as a man of God, stand up here as your brother in Christ, that God and his word will not be denied. Amen. Amen. So what about the anointing? Let's look at it. Verse 18, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. Do you know that it is the last time? What's he saying? Is he saying this is the last, is he saying this is the last time I'm writing to you? No, he's saying this is the last time. These are the last times. These are the last days. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But what about those of us that didn't go out? From amongst us. What does he have to say about us? The true believers. The true church. What I would call, as he's referencing the last times, the remnant church. What does he say about us? He says, but. He's canceling out all that other stuff that he said about the Antichrist and all those people. He says, but you have an unction from the Holy One. And you know all things. As a result, the Apostle Paul, or John rather, tells us in this passage that we as believers have something special that's working in our lives. Or should I say, we have someone special that's working in our lives. Something, someone that transcends this world around us, this world system that will try to consume you if not for this very person that I'm talking about, that John is talking about. He says we have an unction from the Holy One. What's an unction? What is its purpose? Well, if you have a Bible like mine, my Bible says in the, in the margins there underneath this verse, it says that unction is an anointing. And that's what it is. The word unction is translated from the Greek word chrisma, which is defined as an anointing, as an unction. Sometimes I look at the Strong's definitions, and, you know, they do it like this. It says, okay, unction. It's an anointing, an unction. And I'm like, yeah, it's an unction. That's what the word is. That's what I'm, that's what I'm looking up here. But it's an anointing. And it speaks to this anointing as, uh, as, as something that, um, excuse me, as a, as a process of consecration or healing. It's a ceremony that's done through the pouring out of oil. We see throughout the Bible, you see it a lot in the Old Testament, but we see throughout the Bible individuals who are anointed with oil. This ceremonial act was an act of, or a process of pouring and rubbing the oil on the rubbing oil on the head of an individual to represent the flow or the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The best example of that, I think, in the Old Testament, the, the, the example is of David in 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'll just read some verses to you here. God said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, I think it was verse 3, he said, You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. And then we go through this process where Jesse's just bringing all of his boys in, you know, lining them up before Samuel. Check this guy out. Nope, that's not him. You know, God's not, nope, that's not him. Till it gets to the point where he has one son left. And God spoke to Samuel once again saying, arise and anoint him. Anoint David for he is the one, the young one, the ruddy faced one. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, him David in the midst of his brothers. And you know what it says after that? And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. He was anointed by God. Through the act of anointing, David received divine authorization and empowerment by God. 
What did he need it for? He needed it for the purpose that was set before him. What was the purpose that was set before him? To fulfill the roles that God had planned for him. The roles of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king. God anointed him for it. He could not have done the things, he could not have done, executed the exploits that we read about in this Bible, Shannon, if he did not have the anointing power of God upon him. But what about the anointing for us? I asked you that already. What about it? For us as New Testament believers, it's there for us too. That same illuminating power and presence of God's Spirit made available to us, all of us who believe, who are His people. We're only going to scratch the surface tonight because I've been running my mouth for a while already. But we're going to look at a few things we're going to see some things that God does for us and through us by the power of his anointing to help you to help you develop an awareness and a sensitivity. So the next time when you're confronted with a battle, the next time when you're going to stand up in front of 80 people or whatever and, and preach God's word and your tablet won't work. Or the enemy's trying to attack your body or the enemy's trying to attack your family or your finances, you'll just stand back and say, size up the enemy and say, what about the anointing? And then maybe you'll ask the enemy, have you seen the anointing? Develop a confidence in God and his power. How does God's anointing work? What are some ways that God's anointing works? Well, let's just continue on in 1 John here. Number one, God's anointing brings knowledge and discernment. It brings forth God's truth and it brings forth discernment. Look again in verse 20. John says, but you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. He says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. How important is the truth for us as believers? It is very important. There are people in this world that are seeking to destroy you and destroy, destroy God's word through the process. They're poisoning the wells, if you would. And if we drink of that well, if we drink of those wells, not knowing what the truth is, we can be consumed by the lies that they're spewing. But John says that we have the truth inside of us. He says that we have an unction from the Holy One. He tells us there's an anointing inside that provides knowledge, that provides an illuminating power of the Holy Spirit that speaks the truths of God to us. And when it speaks those truths, it speaks into us a supernatural power. I'm feeling a little bold. I feel like my pastor. <laughs> it's a supernatural power that creates an understanding of spiritual realities that deny the lies and the false teachers and the Antichrist and all the others that are around us that would try again to poison those wells. These spiritual realities, they create a fortress of truth that the enemy cannot permeate. And it's all sourced through the anointing, the unction from the Holy One. I say fortress. It builds a fortress because the enemy, the enemy will try through those in the world, in the world system. They will try to build strongholds around us that creates a barrier between us and God. But it's God's truth, it's God's word that is a wrecking ball that just comes swinging in and destroys those strongholds and then God builds a fortress instead. 
Then we go up there and we stand in that big tower. Because of the anointing, because of the truth inside. There are powers on this earth, as I've said, that are working against the kingdom. And just to look at it again, John tells us that they are antichrist. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that antichrist shall come. Now, this isn't big capital A antichrist, is it? My Bible has little a. What do they call that? Lowercase. Lowercase a. He's not talking about the antichrist. Or it would be capitalized. And in the next portion of it, he says, even now there are many antichrists. Plural. Let me tell you something. If you're not for Jesus, you're against him. And if you're against him, guess what? You're antichrist. Thank you, Tim. Gold star, Brother Halcom. You are antichrist. How do I know? Verse 22. He who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. These people are all around you, folks. They're not covering up their ways. They're not covering up who they are. They will get in your face, both literally and figuratively, and argue God, argue Jesus, argue His Word until the sun goes down. And they'll be there waiting for you when you wake up the next morning. Because they have a hatred for who you love and who is inside of you. They may not even know it. See, the enemy's got them deceived, many of them, and they're just doing this stuff because they, they're free. They're free. They're atheists. They don't believe in anything. I'm sorry. Even if you're an atheist, you, if you believe in something. You believe in something. As an, as, as an aside, there are no atheists in foxholes or in hell, Tim. And as Shannon said early, quote, quoting that scripture, one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. That's right. But these people, these people are fixated on, on destroying God and his word and his people. And again, they may be doing it knowingly or they may just be doing it out of ignorance. And the enemy is just using them as a tool. As a tool. But God has provided something for us. He's provided something for us. Look over in verse 24. John says, let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning, beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. If you're, if you're continuing in the Son and in the Father, you're not being distracted and deceived by these antichrists and being drawn back into the world. And how's this whole thing come to pass? How is it operating? He says... Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. What have you heard from the beginning? Well, you heard. So it must be a word that you heard from the beginning. Look over in uh, 3 John. I'm sorry, 2 John. Verse 6, just a couple pages over. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. We heard the word of God. We heard the truth. We heard the gospel in the beginning. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing the word of God, the word of God inspired our faith. It planted a seed of faith inside of us in the beginning and brought us to the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John is saying that truth was planted in you from the beginning. It's still there. Amen. It's still there. Let me ask you this tonight. Let's practice a little spiritual introspection, if you would. 
Do you still recognize that word that you heard from the beginning inside of you? Or is it void? Is it vacant? Or is it without power? No rebuke. I'm just asking a question. But regardless, it's still there. Knowledge is power. Anybody remember those commercials? Anybody remember those, Shannon? Shannon and I are good buddies. We like corny jokes. We like corny jokes and goofy tele- tele- television commercials. When we were kids, they had that television commercial. I don't know if it was like, uh, you know, Saturday morning commercials. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. God's knowledge, God's truth is power. That truth which you have received from the beginning, let it abide in you. That's what he says, isn't it? Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. I know you're saying, okay, so I've got the truth in me. So what's that have to do with the anointing? What's that have to do with the unction from the Holy One? Okay, I'll tell you. (laughs) Was there a light bulb that came up over my head? (laughs) You have the truth abiding in you, right, from the very beginning. But now look down at verse 27. Let's see what the anointing does with that truth. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. Guess what? The truth abides in you, and the Holy Spirit, his anointing abides in you. And what happens when you mix those two together? The Holy Spirit takes that truth that you've had abiding in you from the beginning and he begins to bring revelation to your mind, to your heart, to your spirit, to teach you. To teach you. The anointing brings forth knowledge. It brings forth God's truth. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. Now, I just want to take as an aside here, I want you to understand. He says, need not that any man teach you. He's not saying, hey, don't don't come to church and listen to your pastor. He's not saying, don't come to Sunday school, especially those of you that come to my class, and listen to your teacher. Don't listen to preachers. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, is that God's Holy Spirit is the ultimate authority, is the ultimate teacher. Because I might tell you something messed up, Shannon. I might tell you something messed up, but the the anointing, the unction from the Holy One will say, that's not right. That's not right. No, we've got to come. We've got to sit at our shepherd's feet. We've got to listen to pastors and preachers and teachers. But again, it's the Holy Spirit, his anointing in the end that brings the revelation of truth. What is truth and what isn't truth. The anointing helps us to determine what is truth and what is error. The anointing weighs in the balance. Truth and fallacy and enables us to see through the lies of the enemy to know their hearts and to know their motives. There are those that will seek to deceive you, to deceive us. Let me tell you something. It's us against the world. It's us against the world. Good versus evil. Light Versus darkness. How do I know? Look back over in verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. It's us and them. It's God's people and the rest of the world. We 
whether through be through worldly ignorance by nefarious forces, the enemy is using people on this earth to deceive God's people, to deceive, to disrupt, disrupt, to distract, and to draw God's people from him and his truth. And many times, as I said, they're just in your face, especially when you look at the liberal parts of society now that don't believe in God, they don't believe in religion. <clears throat> All they believe is the, themselves and what they see, what they can taste, what they can experience. They believe in their own minds and intellect. But then there are others that, are, that come to us in more clandestine ways. Look at that last, last, last part of verse 19 there. He says, but they, but, that they, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us, that they were made manifest. It means that they're obvious. You can see them for who they are. You can see them for what they are. But there are others that work in clandestine ways, like spies. That's where the real anointing needs to kick in. Turn back over to verse 26, I think it is. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Those that seduce you. Have you ever been seduced before? What is seduction? What's that? To be led away. Deceit. But is it done outright? When someone seduces you, do they tell you, I'm going to seduce you? If a woman tries to horn her way into a marriage relationship, does she just walk up to the husband and say, I'm going to seduce you. I'm going to make you mine. We're going to have a relationship. I'm going to destroy your marriage. I'm going to destroy your family. Your wife's going to take everything you got. As a result, I'm going to seduce you. No, they don't. They work in, in subtle ways, in clandestine ways, like I said. They seduce and they deceive, and those seductions will ultimately destroy. Don't think you're immune to it. John said, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. We are all susceptible to it. We are all open to being seduced, to being distracted, to being deceived by the enemy. But the anointing provides discernment. Look back at verse 27 again, the second half of that verse. But, at the se but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now that's a mouthful right there. But let me read to you the amplified version of this verse. If I can get it to work. I did. But just as his anointing teaches you, he gives you insight through the presence of, his, of the Holy Spirit about all things and is true and is not a lie. The Holy Spirit provides insight. He's teaching you. He's helping you to unearth the truth that's inside of you. And he's giving you insight into the motives, the actions of the people that are in front of you that are trying to seduce you or that are trying to deceive you. Jesus warned of this. In Matthew 24, 24, Jesus said, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the what? The very elect. The very elect. Sound familiar? Those that will seduce you. In, in uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse, verse 15, rather, he said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? They are ravening wolves. They are ravening wolves. But this unction from the Holy One brings insight. It shows you who people really are. 
Go with me to Mark chapter 2. Let's look at Jesus in action. Does anybody in here think Jesus was anointed? Was Jesus anointed? Mark chapter 2, we find Jesus. We find the, 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 the man with the, with the issue of palsy. They couldn't get him into Jesus, so they, they dropped him down through the roof. <clears throat> In verse 5, Jesus saw their faith. He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But, there, but look at this. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Reasoning in their hearts. What doth this man thus speak? Blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God only? They're reasoning in their hearts. But look at this. Look at Jesus flowing in the anointing. Look at Jesus getting that insight from the anointing. And immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit, he perceived, Connie, in his spirit, that they so reasoned within themselves. He said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? I just see these guys sitting back. They're just thinking to themselves, who does this guy think he is? He think he's comparing himself to God, forgiven of sins and healing people. Who does he think he is? But it's all in their hearts, Shannon. It's all in their hearts. But Jesus, what he perceived, he perceived in his spirit what they had in their hearts. And he called them out on the floor for it. That's what God wants us to do. He wants that anointing that brings discernment, that brings insight, to speak to us on the inside and say, you know what? He's all cleaned up and nice looking and everything and expensive clothes and jewelry and all that. And he's, he's saying all the right stuff, but he's lying to you. He's lying to you. Listen to me. Many will try to whitewash the gospel. They'll try to water down God's word. And they'll try to willfully manipulate us, the saints, into another way of thinking. A twisted, distorted, perverted way of thinking. But thank God for the anointing that removes the veil. The shroud of deception. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> Every week... In churches around the world, there are men and women that stand at altars like this. They stand in pulpits. They've got their $1,000 suits. There's $10,000 watches. They've got podcasts. They've got TV shows. They've got millions of dollars. And they're just up there preaching nothing but lies. Nothing but lies. Or they're preaching half-truths. Well, guess what? A half-truth is a whole lie. And you better tread lightly the man or the woman that takes away or adds to God's Word. They're all over. I read an article a while back. You know, I should have been surprised, but I was. But I read an article a while back where a lot of people just view uh, a pastorate as another career. They decide, I'm going to college. I'm going to become a pastor. I'm going to start a church, you know, grow a congregation, you know, take in money. And I'll have a career. And he said a lot of them don't even know who Christ is, don't even know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They've just chosen a career choice. That's on the lighter side. But then you have those now that are standing in the pulpits and they're taking God's word and are perverting it so that they, they can just fill the seats, fill the pews and make everybody that sits in those pews happy with the situation or the condition that they're in. 
And those people that are sitting there in the condition that they're in, if it's outside of Christ, are going straight to hell. I'm not going to start talking specifics because if I do, pastor probably won't let me speak again. <laughs> right, Shannon? <laughs> but they're deceiving. They're feel-good churches. They want to make you feel good. They don't want to make you feel convicted. You know, sometimes we just need to feel convicted. That's all there is to it. Sometimes, depending on our way that we've gone, if it's gone astray, we need to go in and sit and listen to somebody that's going to bring a conviction that just shows us God is jerking our chain and trying to get us back on the right path. Thank God we have an unction from the Holy One to help us to discern what these people are saying. Sometimes I watch these preachers, sometimes on television, and I just listen to them and I tell Amy, I said, that's not right what they're saying. And I just, I'm just waiting for somebody out in the congregation to stand up and say, you lie. You lie. That's not true. But it never happens. But thank God anyways, we have an auction from the Holy One that says, this person is lying to you. They're selling you a false bill of goods. The unction from the Holy One creates spiritual eyes and understanding that sees through the enemy's thinly veiled attacks. So how do we work this anointing effectively? Do we need to take some sort of action? Yeah, we do. Remember what John said? He said, that which you have heard from the beginning... Take that which you have heard from the beginning, that word, feed upon it and build upon that word. Meditate upon it, nurture it and cultivate it and allow it to take root in your spirit. And as you do, his spirit, his anointing will make it more and more of a reality. I've talked about this before in another message Living life from a spiritual perspective. God wants you to live with spiritual eyes, not natural eyes. This is one good way to do it. We need a reality that is outside of the norms of the natural, but is supernatural. Supernatural reality. I don't know if that's an oxymoron or not. The world might say so, but I don't. Supernatural reality. We need it for there are those around us who seek to deceive us. Listen, Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. He said, let, he said, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Approved of God. God can say, check him out. Check her out. She's got the word working, man. And you're not ashamed. You're not ashamed before God. And you're not ashamed in front of others. Remember those ones that I told you want to come at you and try to twist God's word? Well, you can come back at them. You can come back at them with the truth and not be ashamed. I remember that story that pastor said. He, they went to Chicago, I think it was, Shannon. Remember? And uh, he was with that group of youth or whatever. And they went to a Muslim church or something like that. And, and they, they knew more about Christianity and our faith than they did. That's what I'm talking about. Don't be ashamed. When somebody comes at you, you're ready to divide the word. You're ready to take the word, take control of it and fight back. And guess what? When you fight back, the anointing has got your back all the way. Amen. As we sow... God's word into our minds and spirits, the anointing of him, the teacher inside brings revelation, knowledge, and understanding concerning all things. Say it, all things. All things. The anointing of God brings forth his truth, knowledge of his truth, and spiritual discernment. 
I think we can get another one in. You want another one? Yeah. You don't sound too convinced. <laughs> All right, let's go home. <laughs> Is that freezing rain I hear out there, Shannon? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 10. Chapter 10, 1, 0. Isaiah chapter 10, excuse me, let's be like Rush, turn off my mic. I pray for that man all the time now. That man's had so much influence over my life. I started listening to him when I started working in the field back in late, late 80s and I was like, who is this guy? And I've listened to him off and on over the years when I've had chance to in the afternoons. And it's like, that guy is just, uh, he's unbelievable. The intellect, the wit, the ability to discern what's going on. But anyways, Isaiah 10 and 27. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed. Why? Because of the anointing. Woo! The anointing brings spiritual truth and discernment and the anointing lifts burdens and destroys yokes. It brings deliverance. Can I ask you a question? Can we get real tonight? What kind of burdens are you carrying? What weight has the enemy placed on your shoulders in an effort to steal your joy, to kill your physical bodies, and to destroy the abundant life that Jesus promised us? It's a rhetorical question. I can still say that even though I'm congested. <laughs> Sick bodies, empty bank accounts, broken marriages, divided families, strife between a body of believers. I could go on and on. The enemy wants to weigh us down with problems, with burdens, burdens that slow us down or even bring us to a complete standstill. That's not what God wants. Paul said that we're running a race, right? Anybody in here running a race? We're all running a race, aren't we? You can't run a race if you got burdens on you. If you're slowed down, if you're coming to a standstill, you can't run a race and be victorious. Our lives are to be joyful and victorious and, and we're to have a triumphant finish. But the enemy just wants to stop us in our tracks. He wants to weigh us down to the point that we're moving like a sloth or that we've just stopped completely. You ever been that way before? Have you ever had something just attack you in your life that is just like you just come to a complete standstill? You can't think about anything else. You can't function because of that thing, that burden. You feel like you're moving in slow motion, like that sloth that I just mentioned. We watched a movie a while, a couple years ago, that cartoon, remember? Had the, had the sloth in it. The, sl the sloth, he worked at the BMV of all places. <laughs> it was like Zootopia, Zootopia. He worked at the BMV, the sloth. And two of the main characters come in to get a license or something. It's, it's like first thing in the morning. And this sloth is like, you know, they tell them what they want. And then, and then and the rabbit says, oh, you got to tell them this joke. So the sloth starts telling this joke. And then before you know it, the, it's dark. It's five o'clock in the afternoon. And he's just telling the punchline. You ever been felt like that before? Just one thing, one thought going through your mind all day long. Moving slow, you can't function because that's all you think about. Well, guess what? God's got an anointing for that. 
He's got an anointing to lift those weights. But can we hinder it? Can we hinder that anointing? Sure we can. How? Because for many of us, through, although the provision has been made, we choose to carry on and run our race with burdens upon our shoulders, with weights upon our backs. You ever watch a marathon? Anybody ever run in a marathon? Anybody ever run? Let me put my hand down now. <laughs> You've seen a marathon runner, right? What do they wear? Practically nothing. They wear a tank top and little running shorts, little light running shoes, right? Yeah, they don't wear a three-piece suit and a big overcoat and, and big boots. No, they, sl- they streamline. They slim down. They, they, they want to get all the weight off of them. But there's a lot of Christians in this kingdom that choose to carry the weight, the burdens that the enemy has placed across their backs. Some even look at it as a badge of honor, of courage and endurance. Might I commend to you that that is a sin? When believers do that, they're bringing glory and attention on the enemy. They're bringing glory and attention on the enemy and to the burden that he's placed on them. The spotlight is upon the enemy. James said in 417, James 417, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. What is good? I hold before you the good and perfect will of God. Paul said in Romans 12 too, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which works through the word of God, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, what does God's good and perfect will say about burdens? Cast thy burdens upon the Lord, Psalm 55. Casting all your care upon him. 1 Peter 5. Why does he tell us to do this? Because he shall sustain us. Because he cares for us. Because he will not suffer us nor cause us his righteousness to be moved. He's made a provision. Psalm 37 says, commit your ways to him. Commit your ways. This means, pastors used the illustration before, commit your ways. It means to roll off. Roll it off your shoulders. Roll it on to God. He's got big shoulders. He's got big shoulders. I saw a guy at the gym. It's been a long time now. I wish I could find a shirt, but I can't find it anywhere. Maybe Shannon can make one for me. But on the back of his shirt, it had Jesus carrying his cross. And you know what the caption on the shirt said? How much can you lift? How much can you lift? He carried the weight of the sins of the world, of humanity on his shoulders, on his back. You don't think he can take whatever it is that the enemy's thrown on your shoulders and just do away with it? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. And it's the anointing that works. Lost my place. Let me find it here. Commit your ways, roll your cares over onto him, trust in him, and watch the burden, lifting, anointing, work, and bring the victory. A man that led me to the Lord just by watching his television show, a man that they called the Golden Throat by the name of Adrian Rogers, a Southern Baptist preacher. 
I watched him when the Lord was pricking my heart and convicting me. I'd watch him on Sunday mornings instead of going to church. <laughs> but he was convicting me, Shannon, with his word, that which he was preaching. But he's told a story a few times, and I've told it in my discipleship class. He's told this story of a man walking down a lane. We're looking back maybe like in the 1800s. He's got this big, heavy bag of grain on his shoulder. And up comes along beside him on this lane is, a, is a man, another man in a buckboard. That's a wagon for you that don't watch westerns. <laughs> Rides up alongside of him. Says, hey, partner, jump on in. I'll give you a ride. Guy says, great. He gets up there and he sits on the seat next to that guy. Still got the bag on his shoulder. Still got the bag on his shoulder. The guy says, hey, why don't you throw that bag in the back? I got plenty of room back here. The guy says, it's enough that you're giving me a ride. I don't need you to carry the weight of this bag too. He's already carrying a weight. He's already carried the weight for you. He's already made the provision. Roll it over onto his buckboard and let him carry it. And what about this yoke? What about the yoke? Verse, the second half of this verse. And his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. What is the yoke? This yoke, it speaks to bondage. It speaks to servitude or conditions in which one lacks liberty, lacks freedom, especially to determine one's course or way of life. That's Webster's. What are some examples? Depression, oppression, addiction, manipulation of the mind that obscures one's view of oneself. Lack of self-confidence. Low self-esteem. They're all a force or a yoke that can bind and drive you on a negative course. So how do we work this anointing that Isaiah is mentioning here? How do we work it? Paul said in, in Galatians, he said, stand fast, stand fast in the liberty. That's the liberty of grace, the liberty of God's glory. Stand fast in that liberty wherewith Christ has made you, me, us, the kingdom free. His blood, his cross, his anointing. We won't go there, but Jesus said in Luke 48, quoting this same book, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Folks, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That anointing that was on Jesus when he said those words, that messianic anointing that God poured out upon him is still on this earth. Sorry, I didn't mean to spit on you, Bob. This is still on this earth today. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, but as Shannon so eloquently quotes time and time again, he has sent a comforter, a helper, the Holy Spirit of God, the anointing of God, the anointing that was on him is still working today. And guess what? It breaks, it destroys yokes. It destroys bondage. I need a hanky. If we only allow it, this anointing to destroy the yoke of the enemy. And if we only allow ourselves to get under the yoke of our Lord, oh man, he said it himself in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 30. He said his yoke is light and will provide rest to your souls. When I think about this yoke, the yoke of the enemy and the yoke of our Lord, Going back to Westerns again, John, I think of the yoke of the enemy. You see this horse. He's got this yoke wrapped around him. The bridle, the reins, the ropes, 
And his master's behind him, guiding him the whole time. Plowing a, plowing a rose. And he's just got his head down like he's doing his job. You ever seen a horse just running free in the meadows? Totally different story. He's free. He's free. But then I think about the yoke of our Lord. And Shannon, when I was thinking about the yoke of our Lord, I was thinking about this picture, that picture that you have in your office at the helm. You still got that hanging in there? He has a picture in his office. When you walk, first thing you walk in the door, it's hanging right there in front of you. It's a captain at the helm on a ship. He's in a storm. Water, wind. Up in front of him is a lighthouse. And guess who's standing next to him? Jesus. He's got his right hand on him. And he's pointing like this. Is he pointing like that, Shannon? He's pointing like that. That's, his, that's Jesus' yoke right there. That's Jesus' yoke right there. The yoke of the enemy is this big, burdensome crossbar that he lays across your shoulders to bring you to a stop, to bog you down, to steal your joy. And the, the yoke of our Lord, though, it's light. It's easy. It's his right hand. The enemy's driving with that crossbar, but the enemy's leading. He's saying, there's the place you want to be, son. There's safety, daughter. Amen? Amen? The anointing. The anointing. What time is it? I know you're saying time for you to be quiet. <laughs> it's 20, 20 after, if anybody's wondering. Rob, how about we call this, what about the anointing part one? Next time we come together, we'll continue with what about the anointing part two? You like how I did that? See how that all came together? All right, <laughs> stay with me this evening. <laughs> Praise God. Were you denied tonight? Don't all say thump something at once. Praise God. Will you look at the anointing in a different way? Look at it as a, as a reality. As a reality. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. Lord, I thank you for what you purposed, for what you planned, you purposed, and for what you wrought tonight through your word, through this time as we've come together as a body. I thank you, God, for your anointing. I thank you, God, that the anointing still works today, Father, that we can move and flow in the illuminating power and presence of your Holy Spirit and experience victory day in and day out. You cause us always to be triumphant, Lord. We thank you and we praise you for it. Hallelujah. As we go tonight, Father, I thank you for this local body. I thank you, God, for your divine hand upon each and every one, each family that's represented here tonight, Father. As I speak, decree over our, this, this congregation, our pastor's words, that no plague, no sickness, disaster, destruction or disease, no malicious terror attack come near us, our homes or our dwellings. That as a thousand fall at our side and 10,000 our right hand, nothing shall come near us in the name of Jesus. And we speak to the angels of heaven, ministering spirits to us, the saints, the saints of the living God. Angels, take charge, encompass us, go before us, lest we dash our foot upon a stone. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you, Father. Amen.